Welcome to everyone. My name is Sari. I'm the Public Programs Director at MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Um, for those of you who have never been to a MOFAD event before, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, like I said, MOFAD is the Museum of Food and Drink. We're based in New York City, but you know, like all cultural institutions right now, our physical doors are closed. So we have shifted to online, which means mostly we are doing online programming, um, which has been you know, a challenging and certainly interesting experience in this time that we are all weathering together. Um, certainly a silver lining of this time, I would say, is that we have found ways to connect even virtually. And it's been such a meaningful opportunity to connect with people outside of New York. You know, whereas no normally our programs are in person and, you know, we get people from, from Brooklyn, from Manhattan. Um, but it's been really, really exciting to find out that we have a community that's even larger than we realize. So if you're tuning into the first time, for the first time to MOFAD because you've never been able to join us before, welcome. And I'm so, so happy that you're with us tonight. Um, so I said a couple of minutes ago that I definitely recommend to watch this program in speaker view as opposed to gallery view to make sure that your screen is really focused on our panelists this evening. And thank you so much for keeping off your, your cameras and your microphones. So again, all the attention is really focused on our panelists. So we appreciate that. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this program tonight, just to let you know, which is another reason that we ask that you keep your cameras off because we assume that you probably don't necessarily want to be part of the video. Um, and again, if you've never been to a MOFAD program before, I hope that you will come back. And the best way to find out about our program is through our newsletter. So the easiest thing to do is just to go to mofad.org, just spend some time checking out the website. We have lots of programs. Um, we have one tonight, we have one on Sunday that's with a chef from New Orleans. She'll be talking about her new cookbook, Mosquito Supper Club. It's um, both talking about Cajun and Creole cuisine, what that means and how climate change in Louisiana is affecting the regional food ways of where she's from. Um, so we have things all the time. So I really hope you'll join our newsletter so you can stay tuned. We're also in the midst of an online auction, which is a way for us to raise some money since our museum doors are closed. There are so many different amazing things to bid on. Like there is a tour of Brooklyn Brewery once, you know, that's safe to do with the brewmaster Garrett Oliver. Um, there's cooking classes, there's tequila tastings, there's, um, a CBD bath bomb with Hannah Brofman. There's literally something for everyone. So definitely go to our website and see if there's anything that might be of interest to you if you want to support that. Um, that's about my whole spiel for tonight. So again, I'm so happy that you're joining us. I'm going to have all of our panelists introduce us. I do want to let you know that there is going to be time for Q&A at the end of the program. There's a little chat icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you would just hold your questions for now, that would be great. And then there's gonna be time for you to write your questions in that chat box later on when we do Q and A. So for this you know, first kind of 45 minutes, we're just gonna focus on the panel. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists to each introduce themselves. So Chris Kim, why don't you, why don't you start us off? Um, my name is Chris Kim. I am the chef and owner of uh, Monk's Vegan Smokehouse. Uh, we're based in Brooklyn, New York. We actually make a vegan meat product called Monk's Meats. And uh, we have a barbecue restaurant in Bushwick. And uh, that's kind of our, um, you know, what I do. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Heather. Click. Okay, hi. Um, am I back? Okay, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> I, um, okay, my name is Heather. Um, I am the owner, founding butcher of Primal Supply Meats in Philadelphia. Um, we are a company, we're a whole animal butchery, but we're focused on local sourcing. So our mission is to um, work with local farmers to source uh, pasture-raised meat as whole animals. And then we have a series of programs in which we um, butcher and supply uh, markets in Philadelphia. We were previously, before COVID, um, our business was split between wholesale to restaurants and then um, also retail through um, a subscription CSA sale program we have and our retail uh, butcher shop. We have, a, we have a brick and mortar butcher shop in South Philly and then um, a headquarters with a shop in Brewerytown. 
Um, both of those locations have since been closed due to COVID. Uh, we've also more or less lost our wholesale business and we recently pivoted to be an online um, web-based uh, business model. So um, that's, that's who we are now. Thanks. Kimberly. Hi, I'm Kimberly Ratcliffe. Um, I am manager of my family ranch in East Texas. We are a multifaceted ranch um, operation. We actually are in every aspect of the beef industry from raising registered cattle for producers to buy to actually um, feeding out animals and sending them to processing and selling them online to um, just online based type clientele. Um, I've been home since 2007, so it's from 2007 to now. I started the meat side in 2016 to make the ranch more diverse. And I also wanted my brothers to bring my brothers back to the ranch. And the meat side was a good place to bring my brothers back and make a family business out of the meat side of the company. Thanks. Dennis. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dennis Olson. I work for the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union um, in the meat packing division, food processing packing and meat packing division. Um, <clears throat> UFCW has 1.3 million members uh, in the US and Canada. About 250,000 of those are in meat packing and food processing, mostly meat packing. And then the other million plus are in retail, mostly retail groceries. Um, I've worked for UFCW in the meat packing division for over 10 years now. And actually, um, the reason they hired me is I was actually a community organizer, uh, organizing farmers and ranchers on the Northern Great Plains for about 20 years before that, especially with beef. So with cattle up on Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota. And um, so they, they kind of hired me because of my network, my networking with the progressive farm movement and uh, did a lot of work on cattle markets uh, in when I was uh, working on those things. So that's my sh my story. Thank you. And our illustrious moderator, Alicia Kennedy. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alicia Kennedy, and I'm a, are you hearing me? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> and um, I'm a writer based in San Juan. Um, I'm from New York, and uh, I have a weekly newsletter on food, media, and culture, and I'm writing a book about veganism and capitalism uh, right now. So I'm happy to be here. Um, and so to introduce kind of what we're going to talk about, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a startling fact, you know, that the average person in the United States consumes about 222.2 pounds of beef and poultry per year. And for many, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has marked the first time since the publication of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle in 1906 that the realities of industrial meat processing have become visible. Um, most of the meat consumed in the U.S. is processed in what are called concentrated animal feeding operations, where a largely immigrant workforce is quite cramped. Um, President Trump deeming these operations essential business, but not requiring any real re regulation of conditions or protections has led to meat processing plants becoming hotbeds of the virus, spreading it among workers and their communities. That has made this moment ripe for people working to improve conditions for workers, as well as those trafficking in, in sustainable meat production and those who have already been in the business of plant-based proteins. In my view, uh, diversification of food sources and reduction of meat consumption is necessary, not just for ecological sustainability, but labor sustainability and animal welfare. So tonight we'll discuss whether the US is ready to make the changes the pandemic has shown to be necessary um, in terms of where they source their meat, in terms of how much meat they eat. So will Americans still consume 222.2 pounds of beef and poultry in the COVID world, post-COVID world? I think that's what we're here to talk about. Um, to start it off, I wanted to ask Heather, Kim, and Chris to take turns discussing their supply chains, which is, I think, a, a, a phrase maybe we're hearing a lot more in these times, you know, how to make a supply chain shorter in, in when it comes to our food. So what did it look like before COVID? What does it look like now? Um, Heather, did you want to start? Sure. Um, so I guess uh, for us, because primal supply is essentially a sourcing company as much as we are a meat company. Um, we've always been dedicated to local and direct sourcing. So I've worked to build up 
a, um, a supply chain in the Southeast Pennsylvania in our region to supply the city of, of Philadelphia. And so that is working directly with small farmers uh, with a strict pasture-based protocol. Uh, that's working with a small family-owned slaughterhouse uh, in Lancaster County, about an hour and a half from Philadelphia. And uh, we have our own trucks. We also work with a couple of other local um, like aggregators uh, to help with transportation to move um, carcasses from the slaughterhouse to our uh, facility in Philadelphia, where we then further process and bring meat to the market. Um, the thing for us is that our supply chain has not changed since COVID. And um, uh, it's kind of interesting because as we've seen, I think larger, more national supply chains be stressed by um, a, like a number of the things that are happening due to COVID, everything from, from workforce um, to you know, marketplace, it hasn't, uh, you know, we've actually kind of been the ones standing strong. So as, um, you know, things were happening that were affecting large scale processing companies and, you know, I'm told that, that meat in short supply on grocery store shelves, our small, small local butchery has not faltered actually. Our supply chain has stayed solid. Um, the one stress that we do have, although it's not new to us, is that um, with the demand now increasing for in some local, um, you know, for local, I guess, sourcing companies um, due to a combination of things like customers experiencing shortages in, in stores and also maybe wanting to have more certainty about transparency and where their meat is coming from. We've seen ex an extreme uh, increase in demand. And for us working with small local processors where we've always had, um, that's a kind of a stress point in our local supply chain. It's not easy for us to scale. So I've been able to pivot my business and I've been able to kind of utilize my existing uh, sourcing plans to supply my market. However, if I wanted to scale right now, there are extreme, pretty extreme limitations for us logistically to do so because um, our small local processors or slaughterhouses that we work with are, are fairly stressed and at capacity already. And Kim? Um, my supply chain is a little, I guess, different um, due to me already in industry. Um, producing cattle on a daily basis. Um, the cattle are coming from either my ranch itself or coming from local producers who are producing similar cattle to myself. Um, and I have a feeding system. It's a grass-based system and it's supplemented with some grain. So I have a feeding system that I feed them out um, to their about 1,200 pounds and I use processor. Now, the processing side has changed for me drastically. Um, I used to be able to buy call my processor within two or three weeks and get into the processor. Um, um, back in May, um, I couldn't get into my processor until November. So it made me kind of venture out to some processors that I normally don't use um, and actually venture out to two to three hours away to actually get my meat processing. So now I'm losing up to five processors to meet the need that I need on a daily basis. So that is the biggest supply chain and also the um, length of time that it's taken to get the meat back from the processors is longer just because they are overwhelmed with the amount of meat that's coming into their to their processing plant. So my biggest um, my biggest pandemic problem is the actual from processing to back to the ranch. And once I get it back here, the meat's already sold. I already have a waiting line already sold. So it's then waiting for the next ones to come back. Um, but I will want to just mention one thing uh, when it comes to just the pandemic as far as a producer who is producing meat for end product. Um, I, I think as far as financially for me, it's because I'm in every avenue of the meat industry, it's a different model. Um, I do have the ability to sell my cattle on open market if I can't get them to a certain weight. I do have the ability to be a little more flexible than maybe someone that's just strictly in the meat market. So that is a bonus for me, uh, even though uh, the market is extremely different from a producer side and then the, the wholesale side. I think people need to realize as a producer, the values are different than the wholesale values. Um, there is a huge gap in there. And, and as a producer, there's many reasons why we say that gap is there. The pandemic has made that gap even larger or even un it's even harder for us to predict. Um, so it's making it harder for me to necessarily get the cattle at the price that I normally would get them at because I'm not contracted with everyone that I get cattle with. So that, that price of getting the cattle now is a little different due to the pandemic. So ultimately my end price is different too. So 
Can you explain why the, the pricing is different right now? Um, a lot of it is, um, I don't think, in reality, I think a lot of people think we're producing a lot less beef and we're not necessarily producing a lot less beef. I think a lot of it is just the pandemic itself. The pandemic itself has put scare over it and, and just allowed the prices to change. Um, I will tell you, I just today, I bought some cattle, what we call a pre preconditioned sale. And um, I buy cattle also and I straighten them out and I'll sell them. So I'm in several avenues of it. So I bought some cattle today, what we call a pre-conditioned sale, which means they've been vaccinated. They've had all their health check done. And the price today is actually the same price as last year this time. So, and this is the first week that it has been like that. Previous week, it's been a 10 to 15 price difference for me. This is the first week that it's actually been the same. I brought my notes out and I was like, it's exactly the same. So to me, a lot of it is because of the worry of where the meat market's going more than anything else. And Chris, how, is, how have things looked before the pandemic and to now in terms of your, your sourcing and your supply chains? So, so for us, things are, I guess, a little bit different because we're plant-based and we actually produce all of our product in-house. So everything that we do comes from like, uh, from essentially from like raw vegetables or, you know, like flour based processed grains and our supply chain hasn't really changed a lot. Um, we still are getting grains from, you know, we get some of our grains from Oklahoma, Texas, and some of them from upstate New York. Uh, we get mushrooms and other things from like uh, Pennsylvania and New York, and uh, that hasn't really changed. During the first part of the like shutdowns, there was a lot of like scares about grocery, and there was like definitely places where some of our wholesalers uh, were changing their practices. And so we were having some issues with them either cutting routes or restricting the days that they were out. They were worried about laying people off and keeping people going. Um, but actually because we stayed open, uh, unlike a lot of other restaurants and a lot of other like small food producers, we stayed open straight through all of the shutdowns. We actually ended up getting some kind of better service from some of, some of our wholesalers because they were just really happy to have anybody who was still out there who was buying at that time. Um, and over the last couple of probably the last two months, we've seen things returning more and more to normal where the routes are reestablishing, people are, uh, other restaurants are opening up. So like, you're just not seeing any movement with them on civil thunderstorms. It's well aware that the our, uh, our mushroom producer, for example, uh, was uh, shifted over to a retail model and was like trying to get uh, move a lot of stuff through whole, uh, through like local farmers markets in, in Western Pennsylvania. And um, in the last couple of weeks, they've been able to reestablish their, you know, so we were like struggling to get them to come to New York once, once a week. And now they're coming like two to three times a week again, because there's more places available. So for us, you know, the supply chain was like a little nervous for a minute and then everything kind of like stabilized. And in terms of our, our production, our production never slowed down at all. It actually just, we were able to just continue to ramp it up because we do everything in house. So we make everything by hand in our kitchen. And that really gave us a lot of flexibility also about, you know, um, what we're making and then where it goes. So. And for Dennis, I was wondering, can you tell us how your organization um, is working to improve conditions for meat processing workers and what your your number you know one to three priorities are in, in that work sure um, so back in March when this thing first broke um, uh, I work like I mentioned I'm, I work in the meat packing division so that's where I work on our with our team there and you know, so we have frontline workers both in the meat packing and and food processing side, but also on the retail grocery side um, as well. And 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 so I'm going to focus this since this is focused on meat. I'm going to focus on the meat packing side, and that's good because that's where I'm that's where I'm working in. Um, so you know, we have union contracts uh, with all of these employers, um, and so the first uh, two months really. We're just sort of um, 
really us mobilizing to demand that um, uh, to demand that the um, you know to make demands of these companies and to um, you know try to get them to do things so part one of the issues was that um, so we have things like paid sick leave and there's health and safety requirements but already that are mandated in our contracts but they didn't necessarily and pay you know so they it didn't necessarily apply to um, you know to the COVID situation so like a main objective early on was just trying to uh, re, re renegotiate with the companies, you know, to give us sick leave, you know, to make sure that the that people who get sick for four, you know, that they get the quarantine for 14 days, that they get their pay, paid sick leave for that, and just get the benefits, make sure all the benefits that we've already fought for and won in our contracts are extended to COVID. Um, so that was a big part of it, and we kept track of that. We did media campaigns trying to pressure the, you know, hold one company up as a good example and other companies up as bad examples and try to pressure them whatever ways we could. Um, so that's sort of what we were doing on the, on, on the front line side. Um, in the meantime, on the political side, we immediately made a demand that the Trump administration um, do mandatory uh, worker protections, both through the CC CDC and through OSHA. And we wrote a letter demanding that. And the next day, Trump actually issued an ex not issued a basically the CDC came out and um, reissued their guidelines and made them weaker, even though they were already voluntary. They actually weakened them and and kept them voluntary. So that's what we were up against, and um, really tried to. Um, you know, so at that point, we did a letter to the governors to we, we did a model letter to the governors with all our locals and had them do letters to individual governors um, asking them to declare, you know, food workers and essential workers um, and to provide social distancing and all the uh, what worker protections that we were demanding and to do that themselves. Well, then, then Trump did his executive order that uh, invoked the, uh, the uh, Defense Production Act and ordered these plants to stay open because they had actually started to shut down because we started to have these outbreaks. And so the companies basically went to Trump and, you know, worked with him to write the order. And they wrote, they wrote on the one hand, so they wrote this order saying, the plants must remain open because we want to make sure Americans have food. At the same time, um, exports to China and other export um, countries actually were higher than they were last year at this time. So it was all a ruse to say that, um, you know, that they cared about the Americans being able to get food in the grocery store. And so that's been our strategy ever since is to try to get governors to do executive orders. Um, one of the other things that Trump tried to do um, when he did this executive order was to spin it as that he's preempting the states and the local governments from, for example, from shutting down these companies that they shouldn't, that the federal government isn't gonna allow them to shut these down. But also to say he sort of was implying that they were not um, gonna be able to do any any more stringent standards than that the federal government did. But we immediately reviewed that in our legal department and it was not true. And so that really made us focus on um, going governor by governor with our locals, um, urging them to um, do executive orders um, to provide mandatory protections for workers. And there's now 13 governors that have done that. And then also Virginia has a board of labor that has also just passed a, a mandatory temporary standard. So uh, that's kind of been our strategy and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Um, Heather and Kim, I wanted you to kind of define your, you know, why, what makes your product different from what people might find in the grocery store and also ask if you've noticed an uptick, and I, I think we, we already know this, but have you noticed an uptick in people interested in consuming more humanely raised traceable meat since the pandemic? And how has that kind of manifested in your, in your businesses? Um, Heather? Sure. Um, 
So, yes, uh, the, the answer is yes to all of it in terms of uh, the uptick. Um, in the first part of the pandemic, what I what I refer to as the pandemic panic, um, when grocery store, you know, people were sort of hoarding um, because of uncertainty, and then quickly grocery store shelves were emptied. And this was sort of in the first few weeks of it before we started to see the effects of, um, you know, processors being closed. Um, and, and specifically meat. Uh, we saw a huge increase in business during that time, so much so that the loss of our wholesale business, which was about like 50% of our business, um, we were able to just divert that product and, and fulfill the needs of uh, individual consumers and home cooks. So I, I don't have like specific numbers, but I would say we probably experienced about four times um, the direct to consumer retail business during those first few weeks of the pandemic. Um, and then it only continued as the issues started to happen, as it came to light that there was, um, you know, COVID outbreaks, the processes were closing before they were uh, forced to reopen. We were warned about shortages. And I, I actually don't buy meat in the grocery store because I uh, source it and get it from my own butcher shop. But, you know, everything that I was told um, is that, the, you know, the shelves were empty. So we saw a, a huge increase during that time. Um, I think some of it was from just uh, kind of convenience and the fact that we were in the city of Philadelphia, one of the places where people could get meat. Um, but I think it's also a significant portion of it was people having their eyes open to, um, you know, just sort of what it meant in terms of, I think, security to support a local economy. And there was an interest in supporting local businesses and knowing where meat was coming from as we saw, you know, sort of a little bit more exposure about the conditions of uh, you know, factory farming, both the animals and the people. Um, things have kind of calmed down now, but I, we're definitely still experiencing an increase. I would say, I would say our customer, our direct to consumer uh, customer base has probably doubled for, um, you know, no longer serving restaurants and instead selling to home cooks. And I do think that at this point, uh, we have retained a significant number of those people that came to us over the course of the pandemic because they want to source from us now because we have clear, transparent sourcing practices that they know where their meat came from, they know how it was handled, um, you know, the whole way from the farm through the butchery to their plate. Um, so yeah, that's, it's been pretty impactful for us, to be honest, because that's our mission and that's our work at all times, uh, you know, kind of hoping that people are going to come to us looking for more responsibly, sustainably raised meat. And, uh, and this has brought people to us for different reasons, and, and I hope that we're able to retain them. And, and Kimberly, how, is, how have things changed for you? Um, my business structure, my business model is um, I love for my clients to see the cattle actually grazing, actually getting fed, um, looking at potential cows that might be the next ones to be processed. So I think a lot of the clients love that type of view. So if you come and look at what our retail store is, around us are the cattle that are potentially going to be processed pretty soon. Um, so with that model, um, it has actually, and I love to share that information with the clients when they purchase the product, letting them know this, these cattle. And I'll be honest with them, it's, if it's something I've purchased from a previous producer, I will say I purchased them from this producer and they were raised this way. So I think they love that story. They want to hear the story of where their cattle were. So with the pandemic currently, um, I think my increase of people wanting that story has even gotten more. Um, and it's even helped us increase because I think more people are, are being more conscious of where their food is coming from now than more than ever because they are forced to go into the grocery stores now and buy their products. Before they might've gone to restaurants more often, but now they're going to the grocery store to buy their products. So, and the other thing is, um, I've always been one that I wanted them, they can't do it as much now, but I always wanted them to come to the ranch and look at it when they purchase their cattle. And a lot of people, and I'm in between Houston and Dallas, I'm smack in the middle. I'm an hour and, away, hour and a half away from Houston, an hour and a half away from Dallas. So, and I'm right off the main freeway right there. So a lot of people love that kind of trip to come pick up their meat. So um, it's not available now, but people are getting those subscriptions that used to come here. It's like, they can't come here. So now I want them monthly subscription to get my meat every month now coming into the store. I think that was my number one big seller are those people that now want something every month um, or it could be this ground meat every month of whatever they're packaging every month. I think that has increased for me more 
than just these individual cells. Individual cells are there, but it's, I would say it's doubled um, on my subscription side. And for Chris, you've said that monks meats, when you're at Smorgasburg, you're generally feeding about 40% omnivores. Um, has that been something that's increased over the last, you know, however many years you've been there, I think eight years, right? Um, you know, are, are people more willing to diversify their food sources and include plant-based proteins? Has that been something that's increased? And have you noticed any specific changes since the start of the pandemic and who your clientele is? Um, so when we started Smorgasburg in 2012, 2013 season, it was definitely a struggle for us. Um, there were, uh, there was one or two other vegan vendors there and it was kind of like, there were a lot of people who were like, sort of just like a giant piece of meat on a wood fired grill. And that was kind of what they're selling and people were coming for that experience. Um, and so over the years, uh, we really were able to distinguish ourselves amongst this like sort of meat festival as uh, providing something that was really tasty and interesting and different. And, uh, we, you know, we were kind of floored to see, you know, early on, we were always floored to see guys who we thought were like, you know, definitely going to be like what, you know, like come back to us and uh, almost like be like angry that they had been, uh, they'd been tricked into eating this like non-meat meat. meat. And uh, I've been pleasantly surprised that a lot of people came, but most of them came back to us and were really, really happy with what they had had. Um, so over the last couple of years, our business has grown a lot. I think that a lot of um, people who are coming to us now, it's kind of a mix of people who are looking for um, a healthy, healthier alternative. They're looking for something that like cleans up their diet. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of consciousness about sustainability and about um, the impact that the meat industry has on the environment. And so we've had a really steady growth over the last couple of years that's only accelerated in the last few months with the pandemic. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think a huge amount of it has to do with the uh, environmental ethics of meat production. Um, people are really, really conscious of global warming, really conscious of, you know, sort of the, the, the externalized pollution and uh, they're looking to clean up their diet and reduce their impacts. So, um, you know, that's something that I think that has spread out. We've seen a lot, a lot more people be interested in it. People from all different levels to like from people who are like investment bankers, you know, Midtown Manhattan, wealthier people to, you know, like seniors and older people on fixed incomes uh, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in like the less like uh, gentrified neighborhoods are also really interested and aware of what they're what they're trying to do with their with their diet dietary choices. Um, and so that's been really good since the pandemic came around. I think that there's been a huge amount. I think like obviously people have a lot of time on their hands, so they've been doing a lot of reading and thinking about things like this. They've had a lot. Of, people have obviously had a lot more time to think about food and food production. Um, they've been thinking about service a lot. And um, so that's led people to make some like, to seek out alternatives that they wouldn't necessarily have had time or the energy to seek out. And obviously I think a lot of people are looking for the, sh you know, any, any business that's shifted to like a direct, direct, direct delivery that saves them from having to go into like a grocery store um, or reduces the amount of times so I have to go into a grocery store has been really attractive. So we've been able to pivot um, most of our wholesale business to direct sales, like you know, like Heather and Kimberly both are talking about. We've we've done it too. Um, we've just had a lot of people who will, you know, we we get people who will order from us and we'll deliver, and then I'll get the phone call like a day later, where they'll be like, okay, now that I got this, what do I do with it? How do I cook it? What do I, you know, what can I do with it? Um, and I think that that interaction has been really like helping to like bring people back though, because we can really walk them through how, like how easy it is to shift to a plant-based diet or to at least even not even shift, but reduce the amount of meat that they're eating and like find some alternatives that they feel really good about both from like a culinary diet perspective and also what its impact is going to be. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, and for Heather and Kimberly, I, I wanted to hear your response to, you know, 
beef gets called kind of the 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 devil i suppose of of sustainability you know it's like it is the one thing that almost everyone can point to and be like oh right that's the thing you're not supposed to eat just don't eat that and everything will be okay but like there's huge differences in in terms of production and, and emissions and that sort of thing so for for you guys what's your response when when someone is like hey beef no like <laughs> i've heard that and i remember that um kimberly i didn't know if heather wanted to answer first on this one because <laughs> it is i guess it is a little sore spot for for beef producers because i think there's so much research out there and i think and i'll be honest whatever you're passionate about you can find the research about that passion to make it negative about something else. Um, so I think it's important to make sure you use the right research. Um, beef has always been one of those that's been bounced on and putting a lot of methane gas in the environment, um, bounced on on that it's not environmentally friendly. And I think it's just to me personally, I think it's um, just a method of just finding something, a cause for environmental issues. So one of the thing is they're going to blame it on cattle when there's also a lot of other things that emit much more than the cattle industry does itself. So I'll let you respond to that also, Heather. <laughs> um, I get asked about this a lot, actually, and I have a really simple answer, and it's that it is really important to know that not all meat uh, is, is the same. Um, you know, the difference between small pasture-based operations and large, um, you know, concentrated operations is incredibly significant. The farmers that we work with, we have really strict um, pasture-based protocols. So all of our beef and lamb are grass-fed. All of our pork and poultry is raised on pasture, although they also eat grain. And our farmers practice uh, regenerative agriculture. So they are focused on building up topsoil, on being conscious of like, you know, how they use the land um, you know, the animals as they're rotating and grazing them are actually building back topsoil and improving the land and they're capturing carbon. And this is the total opposite of, um, you know, more industrial, more concentrated production where you have a ton of animals in a small area that are, you know, sucking resources and emitting carbon. And, um, and the farmers that we work with, that's not what they're doing. I actually, I truly believe that they are uh, leaving, often leaving the land better than they found it. So, you know, supporting that and, you know, eating pasture-based beef, meat, it's like, uh, you know, you are what you eat. It's like they're, they're taking in more nutrients. Um, you're having a better product that's going to be healthier and more nutrient-rich for you, but you're also supporting the farmer that's supporting the land. And I must honestly say that I think most cattle producers are one that want to maintain their land because they can't continue production if they don't become sustainable type agriculture producers. So I think everyone needs to understand our, our main goal is to grow grass. That's our number one. If we can't grow grass, we can't produce cattle. So a lot of times cattle producers call ourselves grass growers. Um, so we're not really, I don't think, I think grass is so much so important for the environment that I think that, that needs to be a huge consideration when people talk about carbon and all these other methane gas in it. You've got to realize the systems that cattle producers go through to make sure they have healthy cows and make sure there's grass growing for them. And I, this is a question that'll be for everybody, but um, I did. I wanted to direct it first to Dennis because I know you, you've worked with um, farmers of, of, you know, everything basically in your work. And so, you know, is it possible to satisfy the United States market demands for meat through sustainable sources? And if not, you know, what does a, a better uh, model look like to you? Well, I, I think um, there's a lot of things that tie actually back to that previous discussion, but just to quickly touch on what you're saying, I think the, 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 the 800 pound gorilla on the horizon here, or not even on the horizon at the door, is China. So I don't know that people understand that China raises and consumes half of the world's pork, half. <laughs> and they do it on one third of the arable acreage that the United States does. And, and also up until, you know, up until recently in the COVID, which nobody knows how this is gonna turn out, 
Um, the Chinese then, as they're, if they've, if they've industrialized, they've built their middle class. And what happens in China and other countries that build their middle class, just like it did here, is people eat more meat and dairy. And so that is um, a really big challenge. And um, it goes back to, it, 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 so like 20 years ago, the Chinese were raising all those pigs on 80% uh, of those hogs were raised on, on backyard farms of eight hogs or less. But the Chinese, as they industri, that was based on very intensive labor. Um, and they, you know, the Chinese had like 300 million farmers 15 years ago, um, which is more, almost as many people as we have in the whole United States. Well, as they industrialized, so they had a lot of cheap labor to be able to do that kind of intensive labor to slaughter those hogs and, and distribute them. Um, but as that labor fled the countryside and went to the urban areas, to the factories, that cheap labor went away. And so now China is moving in a very rapid direction to like adopt the U.S industrial model. Um, and so that's the problem because if, if and if that all continues along those lines, that means that our, our system is based on cheap grain. And if the Chinese start, as they start moving to our model, all of that demand is going to be reflected out onto all the uh, global markets. And so you're going to have the demand, the rising demand for China competing um, for acreage, farm, farmland acreage around the world globally where you have land grabs and so not just with the Chinese but others. Um, and so that's where, and, and that supply chain is just going to get tighter and tighter and we're going to be more susceptible to shocks like COVID. So to try to get back to where, um, uh, what do we do about that? What we need to do about it, in my opinion, is go back and revisit the old New Deal Farm Bill, which is supply management um, that with a strategic grain reserve that puts a, a minimum price in the market under the feed grains at their actual cost of production. Because the when they that that system paid farmers a fair price and got us out of the depression. And the companies hated it because the companies want volume at all costs. They don't make their money on the margin. They make their money on volume. And, and not just the grain companies and the packing houses, but all of the suppliers, everybody wants overproduction. And so for 50 years, the, the big corporate lobbies lobbied to dismantle the New Deal Farm Bill, and they finally did in 1996. And Tim Wise from Tufts University did a study called Feed, uh, Feeding the Family Farm. And what he did in that is he looked at the 96 Farm Bill, which was like they won, right? They totally deregulated agricultural markets, unleashed overproduction of feed grains. And um, when they did that, um, he looked at that over the seven year life of that Farm Bill and the price of feed grains fell to 20 to 30 percent below the cost of production. And um, he added that up for beef, poultry, pork. And chicken and chicken or um, hogs, pork, like, well, the four things, and dairy um, for those four livestock things. And if you add them up over the seven year life of the farm bill, that's a $35 billion indirect subsidy to the industrial meat and dairy sector. And so if you go back to like the 1970s, um, we used to have 50,000 independent family farm feedlot operations in the Midwest, and every one of them had a uh, cattle or a, a beef cow rotation, uh, pasture rotation, or a dairy cow pasture rotation. They all grew corn and soybeans, but they, but they, and they fed those animals themselves. Well, when the, the big companies succeeded in deregulating agricultural markets and, and driving the price down as far as they could, that meat and that dairy on, that, are, that was being produced on those farms, they're paying the actual cost of production out there on the farm. And Cargill could buy the grain from themselves on the market at 30% below the cost of production, feed it to their own cattle in their own feedlots. And so there's no way that those family farmers out there, their meat and their dairy could compete with Cargill, um, with Cargill's meat coming from those CAFOs. And so from a climate change perspective, it was a disaster because what, what happened was, those family farmers liquidated those, 
those cattle herds and plowed up those pasture rotations and made the overproduction problem worse. But from a climate perspective, it also moved, so it moved millions of head of cattle off of sustainable pasture rotations in the countryside into CAFOs. So one of the strategies we're pushing for with Farmers Union and, and, and trying to uh, rebuild the Farmer Labor Alliance that actually passed the New Deal is to like pass a modernized uh, supply management um, bill that would bring that would put a price floor in the market and take away that $35 billion indirect subsidy. And then the question becomes, um, what would that do to the greenhouse gas uh, footprint of beef? Because number one, you wouldn't be feeding them as much of the cheap grain, which is all fossil fuel based um, grain. And number two, you would have these cattle back out on sustainable pasture rotations uh, and start rebuilding the soil and fi fixing um, carbon. So the question would be, how much would that reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of beef? And for everyone else, you know, what what does the the sustainable food system look like? You know, from your perspective, um, Kimberly. Um. I think we're seeing, seeing a lot of people use the similar model that I'm using that are able to use that model. Um, I know a lot of people just raising cattle and selling it locally to someone in their community. Um, I see that going that route. Um, and I, I, it's hard for producers to keep their land on the prices that they're getting currently. Um, some of, cause a lot of people are just breaking even. Um, it's, it's easier for me cause I, I have a generational land that's paid off that I don't have any type of debt, but anyone that wants to get into this business, it's hard for them to get into it and make a sustainable type living. So I think, um, it's going to be these farms that have been generational farms, um, running operations similar to what Dennis was saying before going back to an old school model. Um, but the old school model has to be um, financially um, st stable for them to use that model. So it's one of those things is how can we make agriculture a stable entity at the same time going to a future model? Because it is cheaper to feed sometimes. And if it's cheaper to feed for the corporate side, they're gonna go to that model where it's cheaper to feed. Um, so to me, it's, it's a, it's a thin line on how can you make it happen when ultimately you have to stay in business at the same time as, um, making a sustainability. So that, that's what some producers are, re we're able to do it because we have a land that's able to, but those who don't, how do you make that, that division of line? And maybe someone else can add to that and maybe have a comment on that. Yeah. Heather, do you have a comment or, or any further insight into sure. the idea? Sure. Yeah. I think um, picking up on what Dennis and Kim both talked about, um, I think cost is a really important piece of it because, um, so for, for primal supply, we have always been uh, the alternative model, right? We're like Kim was saying, you know, we are, we're a small business. We're able to work with local farmers. Um, I work really hard to, um, to protect paying the ability to pay my farmers a fair price for the animals that they sell to us, which means that I, you know, I pay them a fair price for their animals. We carry that cost through. We, we add, you know, value along the way with, um, you know, sourcing logistics, further butchering and all that. And by the time that our meat hits the end market, it's expensive, but I use my air quotes because it's expensive by comparison to what Dennis is talking about, that so much of industrial meat is subsidized. It's subsidized by the cost of grain, you know, by the animals, uh, by the people doing the labor and all these things so that we have these dollar a pound chicken breasts or, you know, cheap steaks or McDonald's hamburgers and things like that, that are, it's not the true value of this. So, you know, it's, it's been interesting for me during the time of the pandemic and starting to see um, the, the kind of industrial system falter and what happens and how that passes through and affects the market. And as co consumers are being warned that meat prices might go up um, in the grocery store, that our prices don't change, you know, because they've always been based on a true value. And I, genuinely look forward to the moment where comparatively we stop being considered expensive because you know the other the more mainstream meat actually the, the cost of it goes up it comes closer to its true value and 
um, you know, we're no longer an outlier that's expensive by comparison. And I, I think that's really important. You know, you're asking like, can we eat this much meat? And it's really like, should we? And uh, I think if there was a true cost to that people, you know, then there's a whole accessibility issue, but it's just something that I think is important to think about. I mean, but, you know, would a sustainable model in, in the, the way that everyone is, is discussing, would that require people to eat less meat? And, and I open that up to anyone. Yeah, well, you, I mean, uh, go, go ahead. Well, yeah, it would, because if you, and that was a big dilemma for our union, right? We're a meatpacking union and we have 250,000 members in meatpacking and food processing. So if people eat much, eat less meat, our concern was, well, we're going to lose jobs, like our workers are going to be out of work. Um, and the, the way we were able to re, um, sort of rationalize that was, I mentioned the strategic grain reserve, and that was part of the old New Deal. So what they, they, they hold, the government will hold uh, grain off the market and set a price in the market for the grain. And the way they do that is they put the excess grain into a strategic grain reserve and build it up. So back in 2000, um, in 2011 and 2012, when there was first a drought in the Southern Plains in Texas, and then it expanded into the rest of the country, um, we, a we actually had six uh, beef packing plants shut down in the wake of that. And the price of corn went to $8.64 a bushel. So if we had had a third year of drought back then in 2013, which we didn't, we actually had a normal year, um, we, it wouldn't have just been $8 corn and six beef packing plants shut down. It would have been probably dozens of meat packing plants shut down because as I mentioned before, the whole system is based on the cheap grain, right? So if the price of grain is going through the roof, the system blows up. Right. And so to us, that volatility is a bigger threat than not having as much. Have, we, yes, we may lose a few jobs, but the stability of a strategic grain reserve is worth it to us because if we had had a, if we would have had a strategic grain reserve back then in 2013 and we didn't have a normal precipitation year and the price of grain started to spike, there's actually a price ceiling in that strategic grain reserve. There's a price floor for the farmers, but there's a price ceiling for the consumers. So as soon as that hits that ceiling, those strategic grain reserves can be released back out into the market to bring the price back down. So that would that causes stability, you know, that provides stability, and it's the only policy that really does that. Giving farmers direct payments for subsidy doesn't address that but supply management does. And so we, were, we saw the trade-off of having a strategic grain reserve was worth it, even if it meant we weren't gonna be producing as many pounds of beef. And Chris, uh, in vegan eat and plant-based um, the meat, meat world, um, it's kind of facing its own sort of um, fight between traditional models like Seitan and you know, bigger corporate models like Impossible Meat and Beyond Meat. So for you, what is a what is the sustainable food system future look like from that perspective? I mean, I think everybody is highlighting that the current model of meat consumption that Americans are used to is not sustainable. So whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Heather and Kimberly talking about uh, more sustainable practices, which are better for the environment, but they're going to drive up the cost of beef for the consumer, and they're going to put uh, meat production out of out of range for a lot of people, especially on the level that Americans are used to being able to consume uh, meat, you know, two three times a day. Um, that's not going to be something that's going to be realistic ten or fifteen years down the road as we get deeper into uh, an environmental climate crisis. And, you know, like when Dennis is talking about China's meat consumption going up, which is absolutely a true fact, but also, um, you know, he just kind of hinted at the fact that China had 300 million farmers, which is almost equal to the American population. Population of China is like roughly 10 times the population of the United States. If that many people are going online in terms of consuming meat on the level that Americans consume meat, 
there's no there's no possible way that this system is sustainable no matter how good the farming practices are no matter how strategic the reserve is from a global perspective this can't happen so we as an entire food industry do need to continue to look at alternatives whether they're culinary based or they're more industrial uh, plant-based things like the impossible burgers that so we need to look at these things as ways to diversify our food and our eating because it's just not going to be um, feasible to continue to consume meat like we do in the United States. Um, you know, you have, you know, the United States is 375 million people out of 7 billion people on this planet. And we're used to um, not caring from an equity perspective about how the other uh, 7 billion people on this planet are eating, but that's something that's not practicable going into the future. And things like things like the pandemic are just the beginning of the crises that we as a, a society are going to face. So as we go into this, we do need to look at the equity of how we consume, and we need to adjust our practices, and we need to become you know we need to become more simple. We need to become more equitable from a global perspective, not just like trying to look out for ourselves. Um, I wanted to give anyone a chance to respond before we go over to the Q&A and I turn it over to Sari. All right, cool. I'm going to turn it over to Sari for the, for the Q&A. Thanks, Alicia. Great. Um, thank you all so, so much for your extremely thoughtful answers. And thanks to everyone who's been writing in. So let's kick it off. Um, first off, this question is from Anna. What questions, or sorry, what actions can we take as consumers for the purpose of enabling the development and normalization of a socially and environmentally sustainable meat industry? And are there any particular corporations that we should avoid or lobby against? Who wants to start? <laughs> Maybe you I mean, I have them. <laughs> I have the most. I have the most simple answer, which is. Yeah. Uh, I think Dennis can probably speak more to corporations to avoid, but it is to uh, just take steps to find local producers in your area. If that is um, finding a local butcher shop, if it's finding somebody like Kimberly that raises a farmer that's selling beef off of their own ranch, it's like to just you know look to find smaller, more local sources and you know support your local economy. Just, um, you know stay out of the grocery store and like find a small independently owned shop or farm. Dennis, I don't know if you want to comment on, <laughs> on the question of if there are certain corporations that should be avoided or lobbied against. You, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's uh, certainly <laughs> there's some bad ones um, there, and, but you know, in a way it's really more the system. Um, and I think this brings, brings us back to uh, um, one point. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's happened since Ronald Reagan was elected is nobody has enforced antitrust laws in this country. So we've heard from the cattle producers here about how hard it is um, to find small or custom kill processors. Well, that's not an accident. It's, it's just like it's the cheap grain isn't an accident, right? It's, 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 a, it, the, um, a Korean firm tried to open a meatpacking plant in South Dakota a few years ago, and it wasn't even able to complete its first shift to get enough workers hired for its first shift, let alone its second shift before it went bankrupt. And, you know, the problem is, is that there's nobody stopping the Tysons or the JBSs of the world. They can just go in and offer those ranchers that are that are selling their cattle to the to that Korean plant, they can offer them temporarily, offer them a little more money for those cattle, and that and starve that plant. So it's really uh, that's the one of the big challenges that really and we were, we're working closely with Farmers Union and others on this. On there is a rising demand for quote good meat, right? And but the problem is there is there, there is not enough slaughter capacity to um, scale that up. And again, that is not by accident. So 
it, we do have to have um, a political agenda and that includes supply management to take the indirect subsidy away from the industrial system, but also we have to have antitrust enforcement to stop predatory pricing that goes on on a daily basis. I mean, the cattle, in the, the pork industry now is all, well, the chicken industry is totally vertically integrated. That is, there is no market. The, the farmers are owned from when the chickens are raised all the way through to the, to the retail level. Um, hogs are now down, pretty much all the way gone to the vertical integration. The spot market of ho on hogs for the open market of hogs is only about 3%, and cattle is down to about anywhere from 7 to 15%. The rest are all captive supply contracts that these big companies dictate the price to the farmers. And if we don't address that, then we're never going to be able to build an alternative system. So avoid big companies <laughs> is what I'm getting from that without, without naming. No, it's not, it's not that simple, right? It's like you, you, you know, it, it, if you had competition that where these companies had to bid for these cattle in an open, like they used to at the livestock auction markets, then you have a more decentralized system. So, you know, um, you could, you know, that, I mean, in, I, there are, there are examples. So I think, I had heard once that in Germany, if you get beyond, if a company gets over a market share of 40%, they let them get over 40%, but if they get over 40%, they say you are a de facto monopoly and we're gonna regulate you like a monopoly, like we regulated AT&T. So you could do it, you know, there are ways to do this, but you can't just, you know, hand the government over to these big corporations, you know, under the guise that the government can't do anything right, when in fact, it, these companies all say that's what they believe, but they don't believe that at all. They have no qualms about wielding the government against everybody else, right? So we have to seize the political power back from these companies and, 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 and reestablish some democracy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's two questions that I think kind of go together. And Heather, you touched on this a little bit with your last response, what's the consumer's role in helping scale responsible, ethical, or, or sustainable meat? And also how can we support new or young farmers who want to raise meat? I mean, those seem connected to me. Maybe Kimberly, you can, you can speak of this as someone who raises meat. Yeah, um, I'll just, I didn't say a little bit about my background. I have to say a little bit about my background to lead up to this answer. Um, I worked in New York for a financial information company for many years prior to coming to the ranch. And I came to the ranch for that purpose to make sure my ranch was, my family operation was sustainable. So in 2007, I quit my financial job and I came back to the ranch. And um, for that reason, like sustainability. But when I came back to the ranch, I realized, of course, I'm a rare breed that would move a multi, like a three-figure job to not a three-figure job. I'm a rare breed to do that. So I started a nonprofit called the 100 Ranchers and that 100 Ranchers for it's for that purpose to take people that are beginning farmers or someone that has just started in farming and let's learn from each other. And on top of learning for each other, let's bring our products together on a co-op type setting and let's sell our products together to make sure they are staying sustainable because it's very difficult to have to be a new beginning farmer and sell your cattle at a price that will make you pay that note. So my objective was sell truckloads to help them. So if you come together, we can put however many cattle that required for a truckload and give them a premium price for that. So really and truly, that's probably a good system on how you can kind of get new beginning farmers in the industry and to make them sustainable. I also, when I say I buy cattle, I buy cattle from those new beginning farmers, from that organization, 100 Ranchers. A lot of my cattle come from that base. Twofold, they're buying cattle for me, they'll buy my cows themselves and they're breeding them. So they're pretty much my genetics to begin with. And on top of that, they are raising a sustainable way because we're all a community and we're trying to, we buy, if we need vaccination, we buy it in a community type setting. So if there's a way for you to find an organization similar to that, that is ideal. Um, there's always, um, so that's ideal. Um, that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, uh, this is from Carlos. What actionable items are there for city dwellers to create a community of conscious consumers outside of the farmer's market? This might be a good one for Heather because you work in a city. 
Um, yeah, although <laughs> I solved that problem by starting a business. So <laughs> I don't know if you're outside of Philadelphia and uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think there's, uh, besides um, farmer's markets, I think uh, kind of what Kim was just touching on supporting uh, organizations that help with kind of like aggregation for farmers, because as a small farmer, your only path is often the farmer's market and the farmer's market is a hustle. So farmers that are lucky enough to get into cooperatives or work with other organizations that will help bring them, bring their product to market are great. So, um, you know, if you have food co-ops around you, most likely they're sourcing from local farmers, um, you know, joining CSAs, things like that, anything that like helps commit, but on the, it, it's tricky. Um, you know, it's like, it's, it's kind of a broken system a bit and it's not always easy to have direct access as a consumer in an urban setting. But yeah, food co-ops, that's kind of like my next, my next best one. There's one everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some uh, alternative or underrated, under-consumed meats that are per perhaps healthier and better for the environment? That's kind of a, a tricky thing. Um, I mean, Chris, I'm sure you can, you can talk about alternative meats. I mean, all of ours are plant-based, so, you know, that's a, the, I guess, the biggest alternative to any meat. Um, you know, we make, we make uh, a grain-based meat that's uh, commonly known as seitan, uh, which is a really high-protein meat, um, you know. And I think that overall, though, the American diet is a little really obsessed with um, protein and it needs to be more diversified all around so that people can understand that, you know, your burger doesn't need to be 85% protein to be satisfying. You can have a grain-based burger, a grain and bean burger. You can have a blended burger with mushrooms and even meat products like beef or pork or whatever. Um, and you can cut the amount of protein that you have in your diet substantially from where it is. Americans are obsessed with protein and that's not actually necessary or healthy. Um, so, you know, for me, like we, we, you know, we have certain products that we make that are, you know, made from whole grains, from beans, from mushrooms, from different, different things. Um, but we also encourage people to constantly be eating raw vegetables and to diversify amongst a whole bunch of different things, not just be so focused on eating meats. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris, while, while I have you here, maybe you can kick off the answer to this question about speaking about the labor differences between animal and vegan proteins. Um, I mean, I guess I'm not, you know, like I, I have like a lot less experience on the labor side on animal proteins. Um, you know, I came into the industry um, self-consciously to be a vegan chef, so um, I haven't I haven't worked with animal proteins as much. But there's there's quite a few hands that touch your beef from the time it you know it's you know from Kimberly to Heather to Dennis's clients and and people he works with. You know, there's there's dozens or even hundreds of people who touch your product on its way to market before it gets to the grocery store and then once you get it. Um, and with what we do, you know, we're dealing with, uh, you know, a farmer who's harvesting a grain or a whole vegetable, uh, like a whole vegetable, and then we're processing in our kitchen. And there are definitely fewer steps and fewer people involved in the process. Um, you know, there's also, you know, there's a lot of uh, these like new industrial alternative meat companies like uh, that are making these processed burgers. And I actually am not a hundred percent sure what their factory setups are like. I know that they're operating in a much larger like factory setting and not in a, just in a kitchen setting. So I'm not sure exactly how they're handling their labor issues either. I mean, ultimately, you know, labor is a huge function in all of this, how everybody's treated equity equitably from the farmer to the rancher, to the meat processor, to the packer, to the driver, to the um, guy who's stocking the shelves and the grocery store, to where you get it as a consumer or you know in a restaurant. Like all of those hands, all those people need to get paid and they need to get paid fairly. 
they need to be able to make a, a fair living wage. And the more hands you have touch it, the more expensive that product should be because the more people who've had to like impart their labor to it and their time. Mm -hmm. Does anyone on the meat side want to respond to that from the from their perspective? Yeah, I'd like I'd like to just weigh in here. Um, so from from our perspective, um, the workers' rights are human rights. Um, and they're recognized by the United Nations through the International Labor Organization conventions. And in a nutshell, the, 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 right, the workers' rights are the right to freedom of association, to organize a union, and to bargain collectively free from retaliation. And almost every employer, especially the big companies in the United States, routinely violate workers' rights by doing retaliatory union busting strategies whenever workers try to organize and get a union in their shop. And I want to just take extend, extend that back to the earlier question. I actually did come up with a, an evil, not an evil company, but an evil sector. Okay. So for us, the evil sector is poultry. And this goes back to the beef question of yes, beef is, has the biggest greenhouse gas footprint because of methane but you also need those cows back out on those pastures to have those sustainable pasture rotations to fix carbon and only cows and ruminants can do that. Um, and, but in poultry, it's a social thing. So it basically uh, we're at, um, we're at 62% union density in beef. We're at 71% union density in pork. And, and we're only at 33% union density in poultry. And that is mainly because most of the poultry industry is operating in the former plantation mentality south. Okay, so it is, it is by far the worst labor conditions. Um, they routinely, re, you know, bring in immigrant labor to basically to break the unions and to keep people intimidated. And and then they call in, you know, then the immigrants are more vulnerable to intimidation because all they have to do is call INS and, and get them deported if they speak up. And so for us, that's a, that's a big issue. And going back to the drought question, in the wake of that, that drought, when we lost six beef packing plants, for example, we lost a plant with 2,000 union scale jobs in Plainview, Texas, which was a Cargill beef packing plant. That plant shut, was one of those six plants that shut down because it ran out of cattle. And um, basically, basically what that meant was that, that that plant was producing X number of pounds of beef per year, and it was in effect displaced by um, poultry production because the main thing is, is that beef cattle take 39 months from, from conception to slaughter and poultry takes nine months. So poultry is much more responsive to volatility. So when those, when the cattle herd was liquidated in Texas and around the country, it takes 39 months to rebuild the herd and that's if everything goes right. Um, and so in the meantime, the poultry industry ramped up production and took market share away from beef. So poultry is dragging down the labor standards across all three sectors, beef, pork, and poultry. So if, if you want to pick a protein to eat, not eat, I would urge you not to eat poultry, um, not beef. Um, and we can work on making beef more sustainable. But, um, you know, it's a, anyway, that, that's another angle at it. Okay, thank you. Um, this is kind of cool. Uh, interested from Michelle, Michelle's curious how the animal meat producers feel about the idea of partnering with plant-based meat producers to either stay relevant or be more environmentally conscious. Any of you open to that? Um, I know about some folks in Pennsylvania that are doing kind of a cool project with mushroom and beef burgers uh, with that exact intention, um, trying to kind of, I guess, stretch uh, and expand the, the protein and, and work with some, uh, work with somebody else who's doing the mushroom projects as, um, you know, a sustainability project of their own. So that's cool. Uh, it's a very different system. I mean, I think that's, I think it's a really interesting and curious question, but uh, for us, Yes, all of our farmers raise grass, <laughs> but they don't grow vegetables. So uh, my, it's, you know, like my supply chain has its own course and unfortunately non-meat-based non, non -meat -based proteins are not a part of it, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, um, I was just going to say, uh, um, I'm all supportive about plants making products, but I think the one thing as a cattle producer that we, we try to avoid is the word meat and how the terminology meat is used. Um, because meat is actually a protein similar to chicken, pork, and cattle. So I think that terminology um, is something that it's been fought in legally and all the way up to as far as it can go. Um, so I think the terminology is more of a, of, of a issue than anything. Thank you. Um, Dennis, is there a conversation of maintaining the protections that have been negotiated during the pandemic to become normalized in non-pandemic times? Yes, um, and just one example is we, we've just negotiated, uh, so our contracts are up for renewal every three years or so, and so uh, we actually just reneg renegotiated one of those contracts with one of our major employers that was up, and we were able to, they, we actually, first we got them, we pressured them to do the $2 per hour raise as, um, you know, uh, risk pay for the COVID situation. And we were able to get the company to give us that $2 an hour for our members um, permanently in the next, in the new contract. So I think, yes. And, um, uh, you know, I think, but the COVID thing, uh, I think is, is a real challenge. We're still, you know, there, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, Back to the enforceability thing, just quickly, one example is where um, I talked about the CDC reversing themselves and making it making the standards weaker. So when they started shutting down the plants, what they'd do is they'd go in, when the, the outbreaks would happen and they'd start shutting down the plants, they'd go into the plants and deep clean them. And then they would start testing. So testing is a big contentious issue right now. It's, it's one of the key keys to solving this, getting a handle on COVID. So they did start texting. And so they would test all the workers before they went into the back into the plan. But then when Trump did his executive order and said everything was voluntary, they started backpedaling. And they said, well, they can go once they, they do it once, but once they they've done it once, if they go back into the plan, they're gonna, they're gonna take their temperature. And if they're non systematic, even if they've been exposed, confirmed exposed to an infected person at home, you know, another person, family member or wherever they have been, even if they've been confirmed exposed to an infected COVID person, they're going to let these workers back into the plants. And to us, that's just a non-starter. It's, it's a disaster because these plants are like tinder boxes. And if you let them back into the plants, you're just going to blow this whole thing up again. So yes and no, you know, we've won, we won a few and we're, but there are a lot of um, really crucial issues um, that get into the weeds, so to speak, on per worker protections on these lines, you know, working two or two to three feet apart um, with sharp knives and everything. It's, it's a dangerous job in nor normal, normal times and it's now even more dangerous. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw this one to Alicia. What is the cost and nutritional difference in meat and alternative protein? Lab grown protein isn't cheaper and it's not gonna replace meat even after this pandemic. You write a lot about lab grown protein. So maybe you can well, speak to that. I, I don't actually write a lot about lab grown protein. I've written a lot about what, what I talked about, the impossible foods and beyond meat, which aren't technically lab grown meat. They're made I don't know how they're made, actually. I have to <laughs> tech Sorry, tech me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, it's actually really interesting because there's so many there's so many differences and it's very nuanced between like lab grown protein, which some people call cultured meat, which comes it's developed in a lab from like the feathers of a chicken or the cells of a cow or or something like that. That actually isn't on the market. Like no one no one has that it's probably not going to replace meat because we don't even know when it's going to be on the market. Like it's, 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 it's mostly imaginary. It's mostly like a sci sci-fi thing at this point. Um, and a good book on that is actually Meat Planet by Ben Wargaft, if anyone is really into lab grown protein or the idea of it. Um, but you know, there's a lot of cost difference with, I mean, industrial meat, like not the meat we're talking about here is heavily 
subsidized. So like, as, as people have said, like it's low cost is artificial. It's not, um, it's not, you know, real. Um, and so um, it depends on what kind of alternative proteins you're, you're buying. Like if you're buying a block of tempeh from a local producer, if you're buying like a pound of seitan from Chris in Brooklyn, you know, these are probably going to be a little bit more expensive than that industrialized meat because of the artificial pricing of it. But, um, and also it's going to be much different um, in terms of nutrition. Like, I mean, that nutrition isn't something I really get into. It's not my forte. So if, if you have specific nutritional needs, like that's a thing you have to think about with your your doctor or, or with, uh, you know, in terms of what you need in terms of protein and how many carbohydrates you should be eating, et cetera, et cetera. So like, that's, you know, different, but um, yeah, it's, it's, the costs are different, but it's, the costs are different in, for the same reasons, the costs are different in terms of industrial versus like sustainable or, or grass fed beef. It's because um, it's because of all these things that we've been talking about. So yeah, is anything going, is lab grown, well, lab grown protein, as I said, doesn't exist. But after the pandemic, I mean, as I've said, and I think everyone said, it's the, the hope is that um, people realize they need to diversify their protein sources, no matter whether, you know, you're going to beans or you're going to tempeh or you're going to, you know, um, Heather for your, your steaks or Kimberly for your, for your ground, ground, ground beef. Um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the thing there. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Chris, we had a question earlier. I think this is a good time. Like, how do you see the future of the plant-based movement looking, you know, like c taking into consideration, like what's happened with COVID or not? Like, what do you just see as the future of this movement? Well, I mean, I th first of all, uh, I, I saw something come through the chat about how this affects restaurants. And I think that we've seen a huge trend amongst restaurants and especially higher end restaurants where um, chefs are much more interested in their vegetable presentations than they were five or 10 or even 15 years ago. And um, they're making a much more concerted effort to, um, to diversify the plate that they're presenting. Um, so they're not completely eschewing beef or pork or chicken, but they're giving equal weight to, um, other parts of the, the diet, the plate of what we're eating. And I think that's an important, um, thing that's starting at the higher end of restaurants that is going to trickle down through our society a lot. And I see that amongst my consumers where a lot of my consumers aren't necessarily interested in going completely vegan. 100% plant-based, but they're looking for alternatives and they're looking for ways to to make their what they're eating more varied all around. Um, and I mean, you know, honestly, from listening to Heather and Kimberly talking about their products and what they're putting into the market and the price point that it's at, you know, I think that that's something that that you know their their products are going to appeal to a customer who's also going to be eating less meat overall and focusing on other parts of their diet with equal gusto as they would have 10 years ago focused on pork or beef. Um, so, you know, I see that as something that's definitely happening and trending. You know, I, I saw another piece of the chat that rolled through about systemic changes versus consumer choices. And, you know, like the, um, there, there's a link between the systemic changes and the consumer choices. And so what we as chefs are doing at various restaurants is influencing consumer choices, but it's also influencing the systemic changes, what people want from the system is also going to influence what systemic changes our government responds to, but what we lobby for and what policies we set and the things that Dennis is doing on the labor side are also um, going to trickle back down to how people eat. So there's like a feedback system that goes forth with those things. And so people shouldn't be so like, you can only make a change by changing your diet or recycling or metal straws or whatever. Like that's not the only thing that can happen. You know, it has to happen in tandem that we also are pushing for reforms in labor practices. We're looking for antitrust 
um, enforcement by our government against meat producers and processors. We're looking for um, appropriate taxation and, and subsidy policies that make our, our food system more sustainable. And we're asking our government to make things more equitable, not just for people within our, in our country, but also like globally, you know? And I think these are the things that we have to do both as consumers and as citizens and as part of the system. Um, um, but yeah, overall, that's, it's like, there's a lot of things I think that people um, as consumers, as individuals, um, are becoming more aware of and are thinking about more. And I think these changes are going to influence all of our businesses. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, last question of the evening. I haven't heard about this, but is anyone aware of Burger King's new lemongrass initiative? Anyone? I had multiple people send me that yesterday, but I wasn't able to take a good look at it. Um, but that person saying it looks like greenwashing absolutely yeah, yeah it's <laughs> i mean if burger king's doing it like we could be pretty sure it's not good like <laughs> i think i think everyone can agree on that but um yeah so that that's definitely a really interesting development in in the the world of beef and sustainability though for sure but i like amy's point i mean i have no idea what this is honestly um and amy feel free to like start chatting in to enlighten us amy's one of our awesome MoFad volunteers, um, is that like, it's not necessarily doing anything helpful, but like, why isn't everyone doing it at this point? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know about the, the lemongrass initiative, but I, going back to beyond, um, beyond beef, I guess that's what it's called. Um, you know, that, uh, just to make the point that I'd made earlier and others have made, is you need to have ruminant animals out on the countryside to break up the GMO, fossil fuel, monoculture, corn and soybean in the Midwest. And what Beyond Beef did is they did a full, they, they are scaling this thing up, which also raises questions of sustainability and labor rights, et cetera. But what they did, you know, they started getting pushback on, on that question and they basically did a full throttled uh, defense of ge genetically modified corn and soybeans and say, or soybeans, I guess, is what they're using. So it's like, we're going to do fossil fuel soybeans in Beyond Beef, right? That, they said that in no uncertain terms and that that's okay and it's better anyway. And it goes back to the earlier comments that, no, it's not necessarily better it, that any of these type, whether it's whether it's soybeans or beef or chicken, they can all be raised sustainably and healthy and equitably. That's not, it's not about one or the other. It's about, it is a, a systematic question. question. And um, from a, the, the climate perspective, we need to have, get pasture rotations back in the Midwest, both to, to, to fix carbon and rebuild the soil, fix carbon in the soil, and also to make the countryside more resilient as the climate becomes more volatile with floods and droughts. Okay. Um, I also wanted to note, um, you're absolutely right about um, the soy and the monocrops, and it's absolutely not good to replace one thing with the other, but it is an Impossible Foods that uses genetically modified soy so that they could scale up and be at Burger King for the Impossible Whopper, but Beyond Meat uses pea protein not genetically modified, but still, um, again, with the, the issues of scale and, and mono, uh, you know, the, the way they're using land, um, we don't know exactly how sustainable that is, actually. Great. And we know that now that Burger King is using methane, or using lemongrass, lemongrass to reduce methane. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, okay. Great, um, I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for sticking with us for those that chose to stay for the q and you know, We really wanted to get to as many questions as possible. So I appreciate you all hanging with us. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. What an amazingly like diverse and knowledgeable group of people we were able to bring together. Um, I hope to see everyone again at more MoFad programs. I will be sending a follow-up email. So tomorrow, um, making sure you know exactly who was on the panel tonight. And if you have any questions, 
you can absolutely respond to that email and I'll make sure you have everyone's social media handles. Um, and again, please make sure you know to check out our newsletter so you are staying in touch with us. Everyone on the panel, thank you so, so much. It was really an honor and a pleasure. And stay safe, everyone. Keep, keep wearing a mask. Keep staying inside. <laughs> We're, we're all getting through this together. So appreciate all of you for tuning in with us tonight and, you know, stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you.